In the previous lesson, what we did was essentially introduce the state of Russia by 1855. We looked at the uh, general history. We did a very, very, very quick crash course history uh, for Russia. And then we looked at some of the problems that were being faced by Alexander II in 1855. So the first of these problems, of course, being the war in Crimea, the Crimean conflict that was uh, very costly, both in terms of the defeat that it ha that it essentially gave to the Russian Empire, as well as the economic collapse that was really on the brink, um, which was in terms of how much they were spending on the, the conflict itself. We then also talked about the emancipation of the serfs, and we focused on some of the motivations for emancipation. Why is it the case that uh, the emancipation of the serfs was becoming an increasingly popular ideal? This lesson is going to focus specifically on the emancipation of the serfs. Okay, We, we started looking at the issue of serfdom and emancipation, but now we're going to actually explore the emancipation progress uh, process sorry, itself, so how emancipation actually took place and the significance, and then we'll finish by thinking about some of the critiques of the emancipation process. Let's think firstly by looking at the procedure of emancipation, actually what did happen when we are thinking about how the serfs were emancipated. Well, we know that the Crimean War ended a year after Alexander took the throne, in March of 1856. So, by that logic, Alexander took the throne in, in March of 1855, and after the Crimean War ended, Alexander set up a committee to essentially examine emancipation, to examine the, the, the pros and cons of emancipation, to examine the, the possible procedure through which emancipation was going to take place, etc., etc. He would tour the empire and also deliver a number of pro-emancipation speeches, between 1858 and 1859. Don't forget, he was the, the, the czar of a very large, very populous empire. The importance of that is the case that it needs to be popular itself for emancipation to actually have any kind of meaningful impact. He needs to have the people on side. We don't want to have a revolution if emancipation was so popular. Uh, we'll get to revolutions in the future uh, when we get to 1905 and 1917, don't you worry. Um, so this is a, a number of different things that would uh, take place between 1856 and 1859 uh, in terms of getting on the road towards emancipation, if you will. At first instance, uh, we see that the provincial nobles who Alexander needed to uh, get on side in terms of agreement on emancipation, they initially failed to agree on measures which would bring about a procedure of emancipation. The emancipation of the serfs was therefore proclaimed by the Edict of 1861, Alexander's Edict. It applied only to privately owned serfs, okay, and state-owned serfs would receive similar freedoms, but they would have to wait until 1866. So the, the edict, the Emancipation Edict of 1861, was relatively limited in terms of emancipating all serfs, okay, although it only emancipated privately owned serfs. But then we get a similar emancipation in 1866 with the state-owned serfs. So what were the terms of the edict? What did the edict actually say that allowed for emancipation? Well, serfs were to be declared free and they could therefore marry who they chose, number one. They could also own property. They were also able to set up business, travel and enjoy all legal rights. Travel being a very important one, given the fact that one of the main features of serfdom is this idea that you limit an individual's ability to move away from where they work. Serfs were also given their own cottage and they were also given an allotment of land. So they weren't just declared free and allowed to set up a business and own property and then just allowed to, to go off and, and do what they wanted. In fact, they were actually given a certain amount of reparation, if you will, in terms of the ownership of cottage and the allotment of land. Landlords were uh, granted government bonds in compensation for serfdom. So one of the things that's quite interesting about the, the, the emancipation of the serfs is that in order to keep the people who actually owned the serfs on side, i.e. people like landlords and, and, and the aristocrats and the nobility, they gave them compensation, which was uh, granted through the uh, issuance of government bonds. 
Landowners were allowed to retain meadows, pastures, woodland, and personal land as well. So we, we get a number of different things here. A labor surface remain, uh, service sorry, remained in place for a two-year period. This labor service was known as the Obruk. So it established the Obruk, and it, it remained in place uh, for a period of two years. In terms of the implications... Um, we see that the enterprising peasants, so the enterprising members of the the serf class that have now become emancipated, were now able to buy land, increase their output, as well as make money. And as a result of this, by the way, meant that they would be subjected to taxation and therefore would contribute to the economy, the growing economy that was significantly hampered by the impact of the Crimean War. Those prepared to sell land could also there do so and move to industrialized cities. Again, also benefiting the economy because as we see a shift from the more rural uh, development of the Russian economy into a more industrialized economy, we see that in uh, the, the movement of individuals into those industrialized regions would create a good amount of supply for the labor, uh, for, for labor, a good labor supply. Landowners could also use compensation to redeem debts and also invest in industrial enterprises. So we're seeing all of these implications being very, very good and very, very positive for the um, growing economy of the Russian state. The final thing I want to note is that this edict that was issued by Alexander in, in 1861 wasn't one that was essentially free of any criticism you may get a an exam question or an essay question that asks you to critically appraise the edict of 1861 to look at the strengths and weaknesses of the edict now in doing so you would have to know some of the basic terms of the edict which was what we did in the first of these slides you'd have to know some of the in, the successful implications of the edict which we did in the in the second of these slides looking at the economic development of of, of the edict itself You'd have to look at how it served the motivations that we focused on in the previous lesson. So how it served the political motivations, the economic motivations, as well as the ethical motivations. You would also have to critique the edict. You'd also have to think about, well, what were some of the things that were not so good about the edict of 1861? Well, one of the things was the fact that with the issuance of land allocations, there was a variance in the amount that people were given. And there were some places that were too insufficient for people to live on. So they were given freedom, but they were given land that was just not not, not good enough in terms of their ability to live on it and to, to, to make any kind of uh, profit from it. In terms of the actual legal rights that was issued in the Edict of Peasants, they still only remained theoretical in nature. So this idea of having actual legal rights was something that uh, still showed... Uh, a significant amount of differentiation between the legal rights that were given to the nobles and the upper classes and the uh, and the professional class compared to the peasantry class which is where most of, uh, or the vast majority if not all of serfdom came from the redemption payments could or would also lead to certain amounts of unrest in certain regions of, of the russian state land prices were also sometimes fixed upon the market value so this is not necessarily a good thing if the market value deems those land prices to be too high or too low, depending on if we're buying or selling. And we also have some of the former serfs struggling to make a living without the use of additional land. So it went to a point where they were given their freedom, but they were then thrown into poverty, which is obviously very problematic um, and, and, and not good for the growing economy itself. Uh, we also see the loss of landlord protection. A lot of serfs benefited from the protection from landlords um, for, from a, a whole array and variant of different issues that they may have faced. And given the fact that the landlords, the connection between the serf and the landlord was cut as a result of the edict, we see that this becomes problematic quite significantly. 
And then finally, the uh, the peasants themselves, who had then um, been given their freedom, were quite resentful of the fact that they had their freedom taken away, or that they were born into serfdom in the first place. And so there was a lot of resentfulness relating to the fact that they had been given um, freedom. As a result of this, we see over 600 riots in just four months, 647 to be exact, uh, riots taking place across the Russian Empire in just four months. All of these are obviously problematic issues. Although overall you would probably come to the conclusion that given the broader holistic understanding of, of, of the implications of the edict itself, we would come on the conclusion that it was probably more of a success than it was a failure, despite the fact that there were a number of different issues to be had in relation to it.